G'day guys. Um, recently, I've actually come across, well, it was brought to my attention at my by someone that uh, Paul Saladino and Ken Berry had a bit of a conversation about each other's diets, about carbs and stuff like that, and a few things that I sort of noticed um, that I was aware of, but I hadn't actually noticed in the past. I don't know why. But then looking at the video, I go, oh, I just figured this out, I think. So I'll get into it and uh, I'll explain as we go along to give you a bit of an insight. Okay, let me just share my actual screen. Okay, so this is the video here, Carnival Doc Doctor's Battle. Um, in brackets, is Fruit and Honey Carnival, Paul Saladino. And this was on Ken Berry's MD. So I gave him a tick, as I always do, to, um, to carnivals that I subscribe to. And let's get on with it. And I eat 280 to 320 grams of carbohydrates a day from fruit and raw honey, which I want to that's quite a lot of carbohydrates. So, yes, so pretty much, you know, he went from 100 to 200, and now he's, you know, in the 280 to 3, you know, we, we could say about on average, because it's 320 to 280, 20 on each side, on average, we could say about 300 grams of carbohydrates is what he consumes nowadays. So that's quite clear so what people have been saying he said it himself so um just to make just to touch on that point talk about but how is it possible that somebody like me can eat that much fruit and honey and this wasn't what i always did i was strict carnivore and keto for a while and i ran into problems i ran into electrolyte issues and sleep issues and hormone issues well, I think we've covered that, me and Bart, um, in terms of not an, not eating enough protein, which is an issue. Um, he was also eating small amounts. So he was doing, you know, where we usually recommend one big meal. And our ancestors would have done that as well. They would have killed an animal. They would have captured an animal and they would have had one, they would have gorged on one big meal. That would have knocked them out of ketosis, pushed up insulin, it would basically get them into that sort of state in which their bodies were able to, you know, regulate better their electrolytes. Also, they'd get taurine in the system, which will also help with that regulation sufficient. When you under-eat protein, <clears throat> not only do you have less taurine in the system to regulate the you know, the ions in your bloodstream, the electrolytes, basically. But also, you t um, if you're having very small amounts, and he was doing more, you know, high fat, lower protein, which t and smaller meals, he was not having one big bolus. And he said that in another video ages ago. You will end up with not sufficient insulin spike, which means that, you end up with this much lower grade level of insulin um, and it's much harder to hold on to electrolytes as a consequence. So, and you do need taurine. And if you're not eating sufficient protein, which is really important, I mean, if you're eating seafood, you'll get um, quite a bit of taurine. But if you're eating ruminant animals, you're not going to be eating enough. And I've already talked about how the research um, around the world when they look at the N15 data and all that, we actually find that there's always some river or coastal fish in the diet, plus so plus the majority bit coming from ruminant animals, which means that, that our ancestors were getting sufficient taurine to regulate their oxygen, plus they're eating sufficient protein levels to support a lot of those functions. So that's really important. So obviously... If you put carbohydrates back, you'll you'll raise slightly insulin. As a consequence of of doing that, you'll basically hold on. You'll re you'll have a retention. You know, 
I mean, this is well known in physiology. You go right, right back to, you know, um, Walter Kempner that did the low fat diets. What did he do? He recommended no electrolytes because he knew that on a high sugar diet, you retain electrolytes. You don't need to supplement electrolytes. This is why fruitarians can eat a whole lot of fruit and stuff like that and not have the issue of that people who eat a high fat diet and very low protein, like a you know therapeutic keto, they tend to have that problem. And he was doing keto and I suspect he was under eating protein. That's why he was getting that that problem. And also sleep and stuff like that. It's very much when you're under eating protein, these sort of things happen. So what he's describing isn't something that um, can't be explained or cleared up. I added carbohydrates back in the form of what, from my perspective at least, are the least toxic plant foods. Plants probably want us to eat fruit. Honey is made by bees. Well, honey and fruit are seasonal. So you wouldn't have more year round what he's doing. Also the high deuterium. So long-term, um, Paul, I think you're not going to be doing um, a lot for your your mitochondria. Let's put it that way. And those issues for me got better, and my insulin sensitivity didn't change at all. My A1C actually went down from where... So his A1C, which is you know the glycation of hemoglobin, that went down. That doesn't surprise me. That he doesn't know this is really strange. When people eat a high fructose diet, what it actually ends up is it ends up increasing glycation. And when you increase glycation of hemoglobin, what happens is you recycle it. It's usually carnivores that have hemoglobin actually circulating through the body for longer periods of time tends to go slightly up even though their blood sugar doesn't go up it's more the hemoglobin a1c so he, he, hemoglobin a1c is not a good indicator and when it's and when you it's much lower it's also not necessarily a good indicator either because it could be basically you're tearing down those red blood cells a hell of a lot faster because you're over glycating them and we know that fructose does this it increases glycation now he's probably not getting because he's not going to engaging like severely the randall cycle on a, like on a standard diet so he wouldn't have like 10 to 10 fold glycation but he would have the more standard um around six to seven times that's you would find in the old literature where it was a, a heavy animal based diet which was in the 60s and 50s and stuff like that uh with a certain level of about a third or forty percent coming from plants, which would have had a six to seven um, fold type of glycation in comparison to um, to pure glucose. So that's quite clear. And also because it's fructose, obviously you're not going to raise um, uh, blood sugar to the same level. You know, pure glucose will raise blood sugar to a much higher level. You know insulin will not rise very much um, from fructose. So just because your insulin isn't rising doesn't mean you're not glycating like mad, plus the deuterium that's going in is not doing damage. The difference is it all has to do with genetics, you know, how you manage these substrates compared to someone else. We'll explain that further down. It was on a strict carnivore diet. So do you think that there is an ideal diet that's for someone that's diabetic and obese that may be different than someone like me? Or do you think I'm just an outlier or? You're an outlier <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. And I'll explain why I believe he's an outlier. Do you think an N of one in my case isn't, isn't valid? What do you think about this? I just... That doesn't mean just because I believe he's an outlier that he necessarily is. You know, it could be as Bart says, he's doing a lot of exercise, a lot of these other things and he's able to reduce the amount of um, glucose in his blood system. It's going, you know, he's got more muscularity. It's going more to his muscles as glycogen stores rather than using gluconeogenesis. So, you know, that's a possibility. But that doesn't mean he's not glycating himself 
all his proteins in his body for his, you know, and, and, and I've seen this before in research, high glycation has a bigger turnover of red blood cells. So your A1C will go down. So that tells me that he's glycating them much more rapidly, which means that he's turning them over much more. That's the only reason he's at A1C is further down. So he's diluting himself. And if it's glycating, that is glycating in his brain. It's glycating proteins all over the body. So, you know, we'll see the outcome in the, down the track. You know, he's much younger than me, many a moons younger than me. I'm 56. And, uh, you know, he's not traveling as well, I would say. But anyway, let's continue. Think you're nuts, Doc. No, I'm not. I sort of agree with that. that. Was probably the only true Freudian slip that Ken made. Yes, I agree <laughs> with that statement. I don't think that. I, what I think is, and and I actually I talk about this in the in the book I'm currently writing called Proper Human Diet. Again, back to the normal distribution curve. He's talking about the normal distribution curve that there are outliers, and he believes that Paul's probably an outlier, and he may be right. We'll see shortly. I, that applies to every aspect of human physiology. It also it, it, it applies to our propensity to fatten, as our, our friend Gary Taubes would say. Some people fatten much easier than other people, and that, that's not... Did you hear that? Some people fatten much easier than other people. And there's there's genetics for that. Not, you know, in modern society, that's considered uniformly bad. But when you look at the, the entirety of our 300,000 years as Homo sapiens sapien, for the vast majority, 99% of the time, your ability to fatten, that was a very, very good thing. And the way evolution works is it, it always... In a, in a population, there's always going to be genetic diversity because you never know what situation your tribe or your group is going to be exposed to. That's true. There is genetic diversity, which means that certain humans in certain parts of the planet can actually fatten a hell of a lot faster. Now, the ones that can't fatten as fast can become pre-diabetic and diabetic. And we know that, you know, if we look at age, Asian populations and certain there, we all the tofi types, um, are thin on the outside, fat on the inside. You know, there are many of those examples around. Um, and Asians tend to be more tofi than than Europeans. Um, and why is that? Hmm, I'll explain shortly why that is the case and why Europeans can become morbidly obese and all that in comparison to either Africans or Asians. And so if all of a sudden there was this influx of carbohydrates, oh man, just carbs everywhere, every day, 24-7 access to carbs, then those of us who... 100,000 years ago, I'm the guy that could have eaten two, two acorns and half a rat's tail, and I would, have, I would have held my body fat, right? Whereas somebody like you, even at your most unhealthy, you suffer from skin and, and other things, but you were never morbidly obese. You're never severely obese. And I think that, that speaks to why you're currently able to eat 200, 300 grams of, of what I agree with you. I think those are the least bad carbohydrates. There, I disagree. The high deuterium, they're the worst type in terms of mitochondrial health. In terms of how you look, like body composition, yeah, you, you know, if you've got those genetics where you're not, um, you you basically won't, you know, I I just have to look at a carbohydrate and I get fat. And if you take a look at, um, you know, and the same thing happens to um to Ken. That's telling you something. But anyway, we'll get to that shortly. If you're going to eat carbohydrates, it should be fruit and berries because they are designed to be eaten, right? 
And I think for some people, berries are problematic because birds eat berries. They don't crack. They definitely are, and some can be lethal. <laughs> crack open the seeds, right? The seeds just pass through and actually get turbocharged and then planted in some manure. And so I think for some of us, even the seeds of strawberries, blackberries, raspberries, I think they're problematic for some of us. But, but right. the, the, the big, like, melons that you can get. See, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe I'm wrong. And so the majority of my audience is people who fatten very easily. And that's the majority of people from a European background in particular. Now, why is this happening? Let's take a look. Let's take a look at skulls. Okay. This is your native European, which has got Neanderthal DNA in it. Here's your African. See this? These, these, this part here, and it sort of slopes back a bit. There, and it slopes back a bit. That doesn't slope back. That's native European. That's more African, which means that Paul has less Neanderthal DNA. Ken has more Neanderthal DNA. I'm very much the same as Ken. I have more Neanderthal DNA, and I've shown it before in 23andMe. So you can actually see this sort of, you know, the same. It doesn't slope back. Yeah. You can see how it's straight up. Like Ken's, it's a Neanderthal thing. This is why you don't see morbidly obese Asians, unless they come from the north, from the Central Asia. If they come from Central Asia, yes, they do, because that's where Denisovans and, and Neanderthals were in between that point, and so they were. They have some of the Neanderthal genes and Denisovan genes. So, so when we look at that, we look at that difference. There's your, there's your, um, that's the Asian and that's the Australian Aborigine, which is sort of a mix between Asian and the African between these two, which creates this slight difference. You can actually see this variation, uh, sorry, that variation because it's more pronounced in that regard. And so it comes slightly forward in comparison. Yeah. So Ken's got more of a Europeans with the Neanderthal sort of features. That's really what um, a European native is. It's got some level of Neanderthal. That's why the cranial is that sort of slot difference. Now, did Europeans get, oh, let me just increase that. So about this. Okay, did Europeans get fat from Neanderthals? So Neanderthals and modern Europeans had something in common. They were fatheads of the same ilk. A new genetic analysis reveals uh, Brownie. Really cousins that had a number of distinct genes involved in the buildup of certain types of fats in the brain and other tissue, a trait shared by today's Europeans, but not, that, not Asians or Africans. Because two-thirds of our brains are built of fatty acids or lipids, the difference in fat composition between Europeans and Asians might have functional consequences, perhaps in helping them adapt to colder climates or causing metabolic disease. I mean, you guys know, I call it my um, hypothermia genes and how I, you know, I can just move a bit and I warm up. 
So I tend to have more, a bit more brown adipose tissue and Europeans tend to have a bit more brown adipose tissue compared to Asians. So Asians, um, especially so, so, Southern Asians in particular. Northern Asians, because you do uh, above the Yellow River, as I've said before, when you're getting into in, to Manchuria, in Mongolia and Mongolia, and then, you know, those are much colder climates. Those people have some of these genes, slightly different variations. But I'm not going to go into the genomics at this stage. We'll go down here and all that. So Neanderthals um, who went extinct 30,000 years ago, interbred with modern humans at least once in the past 60,000 years, probably somewhere in the Middle East. Okay. And because of the interbreeding happens, all moderns left Africa today. Africans did not inherit Neanderthal DNA, but living Europeans and Asians inherited a small amount of 1% to 4% on average. So, and you've got, you have to understand, there was a, a southern part that actually people that moved out of Africa went to the south through India, those sort of areas, and another group that went right up to the middle and they ended up all in Northeast Asia type, the northern parts and all that. And those are slightly the differences, even though they intermixed to some extent um, because of the Chinese empire. Still, there there is that slight um, difference because of the going through that Central Asia part, the corridor, one fanned out to the east and it ended up in China and North Asia and then into the Americas. The other part ended up moving into, into Europe. And that's important because they picked up Neanderthal DNA as I was going through there. So, so far, scientists have found um, different populations of living humans have inherited Neanderthal versions of genes that cause diabetes, lupus, um, uh, Crohn's disease, alter immune functions and affect the functions of uh, protein keratin in skin, nails and hair. I wonder why people from North Asia tend to have more hair problems and Europeans tend to have more hair problems where you don't get it in Africans, you don't get it in Southeast Asians. Hmm. You know, alopecia, all these sort of susceptibilities so to speak. It's a bit of a giveaway. I've got genetics of that sort as well. I have been able to, re to you know, mitigate those genetics with MSM, with taurine, with, you know, um, higher biotin, by eating eggs and stuff like that and getting sufficient protein to help that sort of side. And that's what I'm required to do. That is what I should do because of these genes. Remember, I've I'm one of those people that are in this higher levels. I'm 83% of the group of the 23 and me. Anyway, let's get on covering some of this other stuff. So they found that Europeans inherited three times as many genes involved in lipid catabolism the breakdown of fat to release energy from, ne ne from Neanderthals as did Asians. As expected, Africans did not carry any of these Neanderthal variants. The difference in the number of Neanderthal genes involved in lipid processing um, was huge. The study also offers another example of lingering genetic legacy left in some people today by extinct Neanderthals. So they looked at some brain tissue. I'll get it further down here. So he suspects that many fatty acid genes were advantageous of modern humans and may have helped Neanderthals and later Europeans adapt to colder environments. The gene variants have been boosted have boosted metabolism, perhaps helping Europeans and Neanderthals 
break down fat more rapidly to get energy to survive in colder climates in the northern in northern Europe. Not only northern Europe, most of Europe. Because remember back then it was much colder than what it is today. You know, so that tells you something about um you know when once our ancestors moved into these colder latitudes and they picked up some of these genes, they were able to better adapt and become and thrive in those areas and far easier than other than they would otherwise. So they had in improved fat metabolism. Their primary energy was coming from an, animals that they were hunting in those much colder climates. You just go anywhere in those higher latitudes, just walk out of the door, forget about the supermarket, just go into a into a into a forest or whatever. There's not much to eat. Most things will kill you if they're plants. Um, you know, forget about domesticated plants that came 10,000 years later. We're talking about most plants will kill you. The only real thing is four-legged creatures that you can actually survive on or some river or coastal fish. So let's just be honest about this. That is exactly um, what we're adapted for. Today, through these fatty acids, are uh, also implicated diseases that are part of the so-called metabolic syndrome, obesity, diabetes, through the metabolism of sugar, high bl um, uh, blood pressure and cardiovascular diseases. These, th um, through the metabolism of cholesterol and triglycerides and the orthoses. So clearly mu much more has to be done on the functionality of this, but it is tempting to think it's linked with some of the differences in sugar metabolism that have been picked up already. Really, you know, it's quite clear that what we've picked up from the Neanderthals really have nailed our predisposition. And people like Paul, compared to um, Ken, are better suited and can tolerate sugar. It doesn't mean just because he's not he's not putting on um, like fat as easy as myself if I cheat with carbohydrates. Um, people like Bart, people like um, Ken, and people like that. You know, he's an outlier within the European population, and there's still a percentage of people. You know, five to six percent of the population that are sort of those outliers people that become morbidly obese extreme that probably have all these genes probably have about four percent of neanderthal dna where those who have very little one or less than one percent like paul and you can see the characteristics this sort of facial the cranial characteristics are more closer to that of african rather which indicates that he's definitely got less um, of those genes, he's less likely to basically have um, this sort of problem. So as long as he's physically active, which he is, he does weightlifting, a lot of exercise, he can, he can tolerate a certain threshold much better. And we actually even see it in Africans like, you know, the Hudsas and all that, when they have seasonal sugar and all that, they don't really get fat very much. They build up some fat stores, but not much. So, you know, that's the sort of reality of um, what we're finding. And even they have only seasonal stuff where Paul's having it all year round, every day. Okay? That's a problem on the deuterium side, which he'll suffer later on with reduced mitochondrial efficiency. So he'll pay that way and the glycation that he's actually um, causing himself and all that. Just because these people can tolerate because of genetics, they have a, a better tolerance. It doesn't mean they become unhealthy. There's many Southeast Asians that can sort of, um, on the outside, look slim. I know a number of them that come from Southeast Asia. They're slim. They look slim, but they're diabetic. You know, once they got refined sugar in fructose, 
you know. Obviously, Paul's also having a lot of animal foods, which means he's getting more choline, and choline exports fat out of the liver. And that's an important thing, you know, less fatty liver, less metabolic syndrome issues and stuff like that. So he's got some genetic advantages, plus he's including a number of animal foods in that are, to some extent, mitigating that. But if you're basically in the Americas with a with a Northeast Asian, because that's what you would have, um, ancestry, plus or a European predominant or Central Asian, you're going to be more susceptible to the deleterious effects of such carbohydrates. So if you're got slightly, you're a, one of these outliers, which Paul definitely is, you're going to have less problems. That is why, you know, I agree with Ken when he said, you know, in 10 years' time, we'll know. But the problem is, in 10 years' time, a lot of other people that may have followed Paul's advice and may not be an outlier may end up with problems, with far more problems than Paul. Paul will end up with slightly reduced mitochondrial efficiency because of the deuterium that he's putting in his body. And the other thing is the glycation is probably going to cause him some issues as well, connective tissue, other things like that in the long run. But he may still look slim relatively for his age, even at that stage. And that's, again, because of genetics. But that doesn't mean you're healthy. You know, there's plenty of diabetics that are slim. The Tofi effect, you know, so because of those outliers. And, we, and people that have got higher um, genetics from Neanderthals or certain other genes as well tend to be, to put on adiposity, much easier. It was a great advantage in the past for survival purposes, as Ken pointed out. But in the modern era, in the food environment that we find ourselves in, we have to, people like myself, Ken and others that, are in, that have got those genetics have to be a hell of a lot more careful in comparison. So keep that in mind, you know. So we need to have that perspective as well. And the last thing we want to be doing is recommending diets that are actually going to increase the amount of deuterium. And he talks about, you know, um, sort of seed oils and stuff like that. Well, they do have a, pro they are problematic. I, I agree with him, you know, the excess amount that you'll find because of the, because of the, you know, high aldehydes, high deuterium, which is double that of sugar, um, even the stuff that he consumes, and uh, primary and secondary oxidative um, products, all these cause a lot of problems in the body. Definitely, we need to get rid of that sort of stuff. He seems to basically demonize just um, those plant oils and ignore completely. I mean, you've got to be very careful because even plant oils, if they are, you know, like plant fats, unprocessed, I know they've got a lot of anti-nutrients like seeds and, and stuff like that have got shitloads of anti-nutrients, but in their raw form like that, it's low deuterium as well. But, you know, it's best to eat animal, animal fats, which are slightly lower. I mean, you could have olive oil, which is 130 um, ppm parts per million of deuterium, which is the cutoff. But you could have lard or tallow grass fed, which is 115, 15 less. You're in that between the 100 and the 100, 130. You're in that middle perfect spot. Even non -gra even grain fed tallow, lard and butter will be at the 120 odd. It's still safer than olive oil, and it doesn't oxidize like olive oil. Let alone the other or the other oils, they can be also like if you were to get extra version of those or from a seed, it may be around the 130 odd. And so, it'd be definitely safer than than raw sugar or process or even even the actual in terms of deuterium here we're talking about, but either honey or fruit. But at the same time they will be problematic 
in the long run because of the anti nutrients you got the um uh, you know a lot of plant sterols so we've got you know those cholesterols of the plant and we know they can go into in excessive amounts if you eat a lot of this sort of stuff they can go into the red blood cells and prevent them from elongating properly to go through the narrow blood vessels creating hypoxia in certain tissue which is not a good thing you know that increases necrosis and increases sort of uh, you know damage to tissue if they're not being oxy if they're not getting enough oxygen to to function properly and, and greater senescence. So we definitely don't want that, you know, those sort of options. There's a lot of deleterious things when it comes to plants in terms of the compounds that are in them in that regard, even though they if they're not processed, they're much lower in deuterium. You know, whoopee, you know. At the end of the day, animal, animal fats are going to be superior. And even, as I said, even the grain-fed stuff is still going to be superior to plants in terms of um, PPM in deuterium. And when we're talking about processed, oh, God, you know, it's just like 255 PPM. It's like double that of, of sugar, you know. So that is beyond the physiological limit for the body to um, deplete deuterium at those levels, that's when you're really going to be doing damage to your mitochondria and to your oxidative phosphorylation and the ability to produce ATP energy. So these are the sort of take-home messages. And Paul, you know, it's like, Pete, I find something that works for me, like an N of one, and then I need to push it on everyone. No, I, don't, I shouldn't be doing that. It's like my case. I've got, I'm one of those people that are 25, 24% of people that have got an ill ability to pull sufficient calcium. So I have to consume more. It doesn't mean everybody has to. It just means I have to, because I'm one of those 25%. You know, I did a recent video talking about, you know, the calcium issue. But I'm one of those people that require more. But not everyone requires much more calcium rich foods in the in a, a bigger quantity but i do and it's the same you know paul you know maybe able to handle better one of those outliers you know that five percent hod that doesn't mean <laughs> that if other people do his same diet they're not going to get into trouble and have a lot of um additional health problems beyond his long-term deuterium issues that he's going to be causing himself. So people need to be very careful about the information because Paul's viewing it in a very narrow, um, what works for me? Well, you know, just because it works for you, and now he's found a culprit, um, linoleic acid, you know, basically omega-6 PUFA, which really from animal foods is irrelevant because I've actually done a whole lot of, um, videos covering the poo for stuff so really you know yeah from seed oils but there's a number of mechanisms from the seed oils as i've just outlined just there you know how to fix the red blood cells how you know the aldehydes can rip lipid membranes the primary and secondary oxidative products can increase um uh, lipid peroxidation and cardiolipin which is after in the electron chain can be damaged as well because of these um, rancid oxidized um, omega sixes. So there's a number of things that can actually um, cause and a number of interactions in the enteric system, in your gut system that he talks about as well in this video. But that's coming from these plant industrial oils. And that's where that research is shown when we look at pure. You know, when we look at animal fats, and animal fats do include poofers, mono, monounsaturated fats, and saturated fats. We have a tendency, I always hear these people say, oh, you know, high poofer foods, you know, the seed oils, and then animal foods are saturated fats. No, they're not. Tallow is 50%. 
the other 50 percent the um, is about 40 odd percent of the uh, the other 40 odd percent is monounsaturated fat and the rest is um uh, polyunsaturated fats it's a smaller percentage but it's still there it doesn't seem to have that effect there's not one study that shows that effect of polyunsaturated fats coming from animals to have those those effects any mechanistic study it doesn't exist it's, it's only been seen in seed oils so it's the poofers in seed oils and it's never been through like seeds you know like nuts people eating macadamia nuts or eating one of these other nuts it's always seen through you know where they'll take out in all these rat studies and all these research that they do they'll take out the um the, um, the lard usually they use lard primarily and they'll sh um, shove in um you know canola oil, rapeseed oil, one of the actual, you know, industrial seed oils. So really, is it plant fats, fats that are causing this directly at the enteric system, this inter that are causing this increase in appetite? Or is it, you know, something in hasn't been proven? Because we've seen people eating nuts that have got the same compounds are very high in omega-6s and we don't see that problem. Actually, we see people um, like on a plant-based diet losing weight, having satiety. So what is it? So you have to be very careful jumping to conclusions. Paul wants to justify his consumption of sugar honey and fruit so he needs to demonize poofer or poofer and you know through association say that's causing this this and this where the res there's other research contradicting that where it's animal-based foods that have some poofer in it or people um, in low carb diets, having eating certain seeds, which are very high in omega sixes, don't have these same problems. So you can't have it both ways. There is definitely problems with industrial seed oils. They do derange the system. They do cause a lot of problems because they're so damaged. You know, with primary secondary oxidative products with aldehydes with high deuterium, and we know even deuterium is something that actually certain pathogenic bacteria take up quite a bit. We know a number of things, not only that, there's, you know, yeast type infections, all sorts of things. Now, could these also, because they've uptaken, be also interacting and causing certain problems? We know spermidine goes up in that environment and it creates also small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So there's a lot of confounding things in that whole research and they haven't teased it out because they haven't done specifically looking at those and so looking at in general, how's this, we're taking the animal fat, we're putting the seed oil in and we, we see, we're noticing this. Yeah, fine, you're noticing that, but have you really alluded worked out the exact mechanism? I don't think so entirely. Some of the stuff, yes, but you're actually making other conclusions which may be baseless. And Paul's using those as arguments, and I think they are disingenuous because there's other... Con the moment you've got research which shows the inverse, it's a bust. It's a bit like, you know, that guy Ian, I oh, made that video, remember? He actually provided from the meta-analysis with one high-quality study that showed the inverse. The moment, you know, with tobacco, you never see an inverse. Always shows a certain level of, um, within the population of cancer. In this case, we saw a complete inverse. When you see that, it means if it, something's not associated, it can't be causal, never can be. So he draws these you know, he uses reductionism and he draws these conclusions to sort of make an argument. 
And that's, you know, just say you don't know. I mean, me and Bart will say, well, we don't know. We don't have enough research. But we've got a whole lot of inver inverse relationships here that at least nullify those things. And we can definitely say, oh, it really, it's not standing up. And there may be other things that we're not taking into account, other mechanisms. And we cover that. And we also revert back to our baseline. Now, baseline is the N15 data. We say, well, you know, we haven't locked up people for all their life to actually test one or, or another diet. But you know what? We do have archaeological evidence of thousands, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years, let alone millions of years, where they're looking at isotopes and quite clearly identifying what our species ate for the majority of time on this planet. And it was a highly carnivorous, super or hyper carnivore diet. That's quite clear. And most of the stuff that Paul's consuming, like fruit and honey, they're seasonal. They're not available all year round. If you go into temperate climates, they're even less. They're even more constrained in terms of seasonality. One or you know, one month or two month if you're lucky. Not all year round, Paul. Not all year round. If you were back then, you wouldn't be able to consume these things all year round, like cating the hell of you, um, your insides and also damaging those mitochondria with excess um, deuterium, especially when you're doing 300 grams of carbohydrates, just because you can tolerate them due to genetics and being an outlier, it doesn't mean that you should be promoting this sort of stuff, especially being an outlier. You shouldn't be promoting it to the majority of the population, 90, you know, 90 plus percent of the population are not suited to it so you know anyway that's my take on uh, the Saladino story um hope you enjoyed it see you